this morning, as we, as we begin this new year, I, I want to take us into a new sermon series. And we've in, I've entitled this sermon series, The Pain and Glory of Christian Living. The Pain and Glory from Christian Living. And we're going to be going through the book of 2 Corinthians. Here, here's the thing. And I mentioned to Rachel, who's at the computer there before service, Right, everybody preaches on 1 Corinthians. I have myself. I have never heard a sermon series on 2 Corinthians. Now, it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. But mostly we focus on 1 Corinthians, and it's like 2 Corinthians is just an addendum. But it's not. In fact, I mentioned earlier, 2 Corinthians is actually, is most likely the third letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. We have 1 Corinthians where he's dealing with all kinds of problems in the church. And then in 2 Corinthians, he mentions another letter that he wrote. He calls it, in a sense, it's called the painful letter that we don't have in our hands anymore as, as there were those who were rising up against Paul's authority and so forth, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then in response to their response to that second letter, the painful letter, Paul writes 2 Corinthians, so... Technically, maybe it's 3 Corinthians, right? Um, so we're going to be looking at the book of 2 Corinthians, and you'll see in a few moments why I've entitled it The Pain and the Glory of Christian Living. I know some of you are, are already thinking, couldn't you just call it, Pastor, The Glory of Christian Living? I mean, wouldn't you like that? Come on, wouldn't you like that, right? But you'll see that's not where Paul is at. So let me, let me throw out a couple of true or false sentences to you and you're going to respond okay true or false one the more spiritual you are the less problems you will have second the more you serve christ the less hardships you'll face third when you're living as a follower of jesus christ everyone will love you and applaud you i think you all passed the test all right so we can go home now right no no so yeah obviously all the answer to all those statements is false. In fact, here's the deal. If you came to Christ thinking that putting your faith in him was going to make your life easier, I hate to break the news to you. The Bible never promises anything like that. But the truth is, even as we follow Jesus, all kinds of negative things still happen to us. Sickness, disaster, disappointment, sorrow, death. Add to that the fact that there will be those who, as Jesus said, will hate us and seek to undermine us, even destroy us because of our faith in him. In fact, just take a quick look at the life of Jesus for evidence. Or look at the life of the Apostle Paul, as we'll see here in the book of Second Corinthians. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. There is, there, there's kind of like this word out there, and we use it in evangelism a lot. Like, if you come to Jesus, he's really going to help you through life, and life is going to turn out to be really good. Well, can I tell us this morning, I mean, it's true, as we'll see. He comes alongside of us to help us and so forth. But can I tell you this? And I know I've mentioned before, Jesus didn't come and die on a cross so that we could have a better life here on earth. You know why Jesus came and died on a cross? So that we could have an eternity in heaven with our heavenly father. Amen, church? That's why he died, right? Well, in this letter to the Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes out of his own experience, and although that although he was doing the will of God, as we'll see, he was serving Christ, he was living filled with the Spirit, spiritual beyond measure, we might say, he was experiencing all kinds of difficulties and pain. As we'll see, when Paul was writing this letter, he was facing all kinds of adversity, even from within, especially from within this congregation of people whom he had loved and to whom he had invested so much of himself. In fact, there were those who, who rejected Paul's apostleship because in their estimation, he was too weak. He had gone through too much adversity. He had suffered too much. After all, the pastor shouldn't suffer. The pastor shouldn't come across so weak and be on his bed crying at night when his body's in pain. And thus, through this letter, Paul gives to us a spiritual perspective on how we are to view and handle the pain that comes into our lives 
but not just the pain, but as well the glory that can be found in the midst of it and through it all. As we'll see, Paul doesn't only speak of the pain of his life, but he as well, as we'll see, he writes of the glory that was in store for him and all who persevere in their faith, the many good things that God is able to do through the pain of our lives. One person wrote these words, the central theme of 2 Corinthians is the relationship between suffering and the power of the Spirit in Paul's apostolic life, ministry, and message. Paul's opponents had questioned his motives and his personal courage. They argued that he had suffered too much to be, to be a Spirit-filled apostle of the risen Christ. But Paul argues that his suffering is the means God uses to reveal his glory. And as we read through the book of 2 Corinthians, we're going to find that there are certain words that, that are key for Paul. It's actually a mixture of words that few of us would have chosen to ever put together in the same sentence. And yet Paul ties them together again and again as he speaks of pain, hardship, affliction, comfort, help, joy, rejoice, and glory. And one of the key verses, I believe, to the book of 2 Corinthians is found in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Has anybody ever felt like that? Come on, church. Anybody ever felt like outwardly you're wasting away, right? Yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I'm not going to break down that verse for us because we're going to get to it in a few weeks. But that's a key verse. Maybe you want to highlight it, note it, you circle it in your Bible, whatever. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17, because it's key for what Paul is going to say through this book. And so the book of 2 Corinthians is very much about how we as Christians, we deal with and respond to the pain that comes into our lives and the glory that can be found in the midst of it all. And that's why I've entitled this series, The Pain and Glory of Christian Living. And so today, we're going to begin our journey through the book of 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And our message this morning is entitled, From Pain to Gain. From pain to gain. And I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, down through verse 11. Did you find it yet in your Bible? Yes? No? Maybe so? Okay. Okay, we got it, church. You have it? Okay. Okay, because it's nice to have it on the screen, but it's even better to be able to follow along in your own Bible. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so, so also you share in our comfort. Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the, the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. May God bless his word to us this morning and everybody said, amen. amen. And so we've all heard it said, no pain, no, pain. come on, no pain, no Right? And we usually use that phrase in reference to physical training, do we not? Right? Right? 
In fact, I tell Kim sometimes, like, like if the day after I've, say, done some, some lifting or whatever, and I know I look really jacked and bulked, you know, today, you know, don't laugh, you know? I'm doing my best, you know? But if, if a day or two later, I'm like sore, like in my pecs and my legs, I'm like, yes, we're making progress. And she's like, what are you, crazy, you know? No pain, no gain. And yeah, it's applied to physical training, but it can also be applied to many other areas of life, like working hard to get that degree, to build a business, reaching any number of goals. Because we all know that most things in life that are of any worth or value require an investment on our part. And his words don't sound to us like, like some of the positive preaching we've gotten used to in our day and age. You know, name it and claim it. Don't confess anything negative. God forbid you should say, I have a pain in my ankle, which, by the way, I still do. Only speak positives. Paul seems to write about too many negatives. He emits feelings that most of us have been told, either directly or indirectly, to stuff away less, less um, we would appear to lack faith. But you see, Paul is being very real, very real. And in being real, he gives to us the full picture of his life. He freely shares not just the positive aspects of his life, like, hey, I'm the hero, the apostle. But he's transparent and honest enough to share the negative ones of his life as well. And notice, however, that although he was feeling as if he couldn't take any more, Paul as well knew that God was there and that God was at work and that through all the pain there would be great gain. And thus, Paul, he had not lost faith. He held on to hope. He believed in a God who could raise the dead. He knew that he served a God who was able to take the negatives of our lives. And as he writes to the Romans, he works all, thing to get all things together for the good of those who love him. Paul knew that God was still at work and that, in, that, that his pain would eventually result in gain. Gain for himself, gain for those to whom he ministered to, and most of all, gain for the glory of God. And Paul just might say to us today, listen, no pain, no gain, even in your walk with Christ. For Paul knew that all the troubles and the afflictions of his life were an opportunity for great gain. And through the pain and affliction he had faced, Paul had experienced God at work in his life firsthand. Thus he could write in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. In verse 10 he writes, He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. See, Paul had been through some very, very hard times, times during which he desperately needed God's help. And as he looked back over those times, he could see how God himself had come alongside of him to help him, to console him, to strengthen him. Paul had been in that place wherein he had experienced God at work in the midst of each and every difficult time of his life. Paul could look back and see how God came alongside of him to help him, deliver him, comfort whatever needed to be done in that moment. Paul had experienced for himself the deliverance of God, the comfort of God, the compassion of God. And listen, church, as difficulties and hardships and pain come into our lives, each one becomes an opportunity for us to experience God in a way that we might not otherwise experience him. For you see, it's in the times of opposition, in the times of distress and difficulty, in times of trouble, pain, and sorrow, that we get to experience God as our comforter, as our helper, as our healer, as our shield. It's during these times that we come to know him as a God who is our provider, our protector, our peace, as a God who intervenes in the lives of his people, as a God who is always faithful to his people. It's during the, the, it's during the pain of life that we experience God in ways that make the scriptures come come alive in the faithfulness of God, very, very real. And I can tell you, that's the truth in my life. That just about all of my testimonies come out of the most painful and difficult circumstances of my life. And I would, I would, I would gather to say that the same is true for you. That when you stand and you give a testimony, as you tell people about the work of God in your life, it's most often what God has done in your life through the pain you've experienced, through the difficulties you've gone through. 
Paul writes in Romans 5, that we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. In other words, Paul was saying, listen, as we go through sufferings, God is working in such a way that ultimately we experience the Holy Spirit being poured into our lives in the midst of it all. And if today you find yourself in a battle, Maybe you're facing pain or sorrow or some sort of affliction. You're surrounded by maybe circumstances that seem to be totally debilitating. I want to encourage you to seize this time. Seize this time as your opportunity to experience God's work within your life firsthand. To gain a revelation of God such that you've never had before. Trust God with your life. Reach out to him and ask him to reveal himself as that faithful God that he is, as that compassionate God that he is, as the powerful God that he is. This is your opportunity to experience God at work in your life as maybe never before. Your pain can result in great gain in your walk with Christ as you experience the work of God firsthand. But secondly, this morning, Paul saw his pain as an opportunity for God to work in the lives of others an opportunity for God to work in the lives of others. And yes, Paul, he knew that that his pain was an opportunity for spiritual growth within his own life, but he did not stop there. For in fact, more important to him was the effect that his pain and troubles and all that God would do through them would have on the people to whom he ministered. For Paul saw his pain as an opportunity for God to work to bring gain, not just into his life, but into the lives of those around him. For he writes in verse 6, He says, if we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. For Paul knew that whether he was in distress or comfort, that all of it will be used for the good of the church. All of it will be used for the sake of others, those whom he loved, to whom he'd been called to minister. Because listen, Paul was not so self-centered or self-focused to presume that his life and all he experienced in life was just about him, that it was all just about himself. He was not so presumptuous to think that all of heaven revolved around him. And I'm sorry to say, that's kind of the picture we have today in our walk with Christ, that everything is about me. Everything's about us, that we're the center of the story. Guess what? You're not the center of the story. Jesus is the center of the story. Amen, church? Oh, uh, that's a weak amen. He was not so presumptuous to think that all of heaven revolved around him. He had a bigger picture in mind of his life and ministry. He knew that all he experienced was not just for him, but was meant to spill out of his life into the lives of others. And thus, whether he was currently in the midst of a terribly tough time or had come through it to the other side, having experienced the help of God, he knew that ultimately it would all be used to benefit others. So in verse 4, he writes, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. He goes on to say, through Christ, our comfort overflows, spills out. Can you imagine this morning, just think what it would be like if all the work of Christ in your life to help you, to heal you, to comfort you, to take you through those tough times just spilled out to those around you. You see, Paul knew that he was not, he himself was not the end product of the work of God in his life. So he wrote, if we are comforted, it is for for your comfort. It's in churches, we face the pain that life brings our way. We have opportunity not only to receive the ministry of Christ in our lives, but to allow that ministry to spill over into the lives of others. And many of us know exactly what that means. Having gone through grief, much, we're much better at ministering to those in the midst of grief. Debbie Walsh is teaching the course with me on Wednesday nights about lamentations and grief and, and all of that. Because if you know her testimony, she's been through much grief in her life. Those of us who have gone through deep illness 
We know we're much better able to minister to those who are ill than we were before we went through the illness. Having been rejected or betrayed, you can now minister to those who are the rejected and the betrayed. Having gone through times of despair, you're able to minister to those who are facing times of despair. But listen, this is not just about sympathy or empathy. This is not just about being able to relate. This is about taking what God has done in your life and pouring it out into the life of someone else. Do you catch that this morning? This isn't just, oh, I can relate to you. Yeah, I've been sick too. No, no, no. This is about taking what God has done in your life and pouring it out. This is about taking the comfort and the help that God has brought to you and then using that same comfort and help to minister to someone else. Let me tell you what God did in my life. And I can think of, I can think of the mom that Kim and I have been good friends with who lost that baby just before birth and standing there in that church by that casket. Little baby. Right, but what God did in her life and her husband's life and the way God used that to minister into the lives of others. It doesn't make any sense to us, right? But all we know is this. What God pours into our lives, we now pour into the lives of others. Ultimately, it's about allowing the Holy Spirit to minister through us that which has been ministered to us. And I can remember the week that my dad passed away in May 2014. We actually buried him on his 86th birthday, May 10th, which was a Saturday. And I knew that that next day, Sunday, we were at the church in Queens. I could have stayed home. In fact, that was my tendency, like, God, I just, like, I, I need a breather. Anybody ever been there? Right? I just need a breather. We've been through a lot watching, we've been through a lot watching my dad decline over a three-month period with a brain tumor, and then he dies. I was there the night. I was holding his hand when he took his last, last breath. And um, we he, he passes. We Basically, I had to put together the whole service on behalf of my family, and... Um, Right? I, just, I just needed a break, so I thought. At the same time, God was so faithful to myself and our family. And it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to me as we were going through that, that that Sunday morning, I needed to be in church with my congregation. And I was, I was ministering to mostly a young adult congregation, 20s and 30s. And it was kind of like, like the Lord spoke to me and said, listen, this church of young people, they need to see their pastor in grief. But they also need to see a pastor who's been comforted by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that I needed to give of myself that day to minister to them the same comfort that God was pouring into my life. Can I tell you that was a really hard Sunday? That was a tough Sunday. But I was so glad looking back that I didn't just stay home in bed and just kind of stay under my covers, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? And listen, each of us needs to come to the place wherein we say, all of my pain was worth it because it resulted in someone else's gain. That all my pain, trouble, even despair was worthwhile as I see your life filled with the comfort and the help of God. That my pain can be your gain as you experience the work of God for yourself. Thirdly, this morning, Paul, he saw his pain as an opportunity for God to receive praise, an opportunity for God to receive praise. He writes in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Verses 10 and 11, he says, On him we've set our hope that he will continue to, to deliver us as you help us by your prayers, and then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. See, Paul saw his pain, his distress, his hardship as an opportunity for the church to come together 
together in prayer and then subsequently to see their prayers answered by God. He saw all the negative situations he faced as a great opportunity for the believers to join together in prayer and then see their prayers answered as God responded to the prayers of his people so that ultimately God would receive thanksgiving and praise. See, for good or bad, it's often through the pain and the trials of our lives that we come together and seek God in prayer, is it not? I mean, it shouldn't be the only time we should come together to pray. But it does make sense when we're going through a hard time that we would seek God. And this could be for the church as a whole as we face maybe opposition from those who would hinder the work of God, some great difficulties or, or obstacle. I remember when our church in North Jersey was, was having to go before a planning board and there was so much opposition in the neighborhood, but people just began to pray. And God gave us favor. Could be some great financial need, some large decision that needs to be made, but, but as those things come up, the church comes together to pray. Or it could be as one of our members face a terrible trial within their own personal life, and we rally around them through our prayers. We see it time and again in the book of Acts as the church is being persecuted, and the apostles are arrested and thrown in prison. And the church, in, in response to all of that, they gather to pray. And as God answers their prayers, the name of Jesus is lifted up. Many come to believe, and God receives the glory. Listen, as God's people pray, how many of us know God responds? Do you believe that, church? That God responds to the prayers of his people. As they go through the pain of life and begin to pray, God has opportunity to show himself faithful, to minister his grace, his power, his comfort, to demonstrate that he's a God who answers the prayers of his people and to give his people reason to give thanks. And as God responds, we give thanks and praise in a way that we might not otherwise have. As we look back and see the faithfulness of God demonstrated in the midst of our pain, we can't help but testify of his love, his power, and his grace. And thus, not only do we gain from what we have faced and what God has done, but God gains as, we, as he receives praise. His name is magnified as God's people tell of his wonderful works, as God's people testify to the greatness of their God whom they serve, as God's people lift their voices as one in thanksgiving and praise. God receives the glory, not me, not you, but God receives the glory. Amen, church? Amen. Hallelujah. Kim, if you come. As the people of God, listen, we know that, that all the difficulties and trials and pain that we face in life, and they will come. But each one is an opportunity for God to work, for God to answer our prayers, for God to reveal his love, his compassion, his grace, his glory, and ultimately for God to receive the praise. And listen, of course, we would like it if our lives were free of pain. Amen? Amen. Come on, I don't like this pain. It's telling you, oh, you don't have your boot on anymore. Well, the doctor says it's not going to help anymore. Just... You know, do your best to live with the pain. No, no, no. Yeah. Let's pray that it heals up, right? Right? But we love to have a life that's free of pain. None of us enjoys conflicts, afflictions, sorrows, and the difficulties that life brings our way. And yet Paul's words remind us that God is able to take your pain and turn it into gain. Do you believe that this morning? God is able to take your pain and turn it into gain. For each point of pain is an opportunity for gain. Gain in your life as you experience the work of God in a very real and personal way. As you experience God in a way that you would not have otherwise experienced him. Gain in the lives of others as you pour into their lives that which God pours into your life. And gain for himself as he, his glory is revealed. And as his people respond with great thanksgiving and praise. Yeah, as I was going through this message, there's a song that kept coming to my head. I, so Rob Green, I know this is your favorite song. But I'm not inviting you to come up and sing it for us, okay? Actually, Kim, what key are you in? Can you go to E flat? Isn't it nice that I can just tell her to do that, you know? Like, what a good wife I married. Right? 
Come on, somebody else has to say amen, you know? Right, right, right. Thank you. Right, right. The old song by Andre Crouch says, I've had many tears and sorrows. I got to stand up. I can't take this anymore. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. He writes, I've been a lot of places and I've seen millions of faces, but there were times when I felt so all alone. Anybody ever feel all alone? But in my lonely hours, yes, those precious lonely hours, Jesus lets me know that I was his own. That's the reason I say, through it all. Come on, if you know it, sing it with me. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus, and I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. And the third verse says, So I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valleys, and I thank Him for the storms He's brought me through. If I've never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in His Word could do. Come on, stand together, sing it with me. Through it all, through it all. It's just simple, you don't need the words here. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. We're singing through it all. Through it all. I've learned to depend upon His work. Come on, sing it one more time. Sing through it all. Trusting God, oh, through it all, yes, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Listen, church, today you might find yourself in a very hard place. Maybe you're experiencing all kinds of difficulties. You're filled with distress sorrow, pain, and you're, maybe you're moving towards that point of despair. But that means that today just might be God's opportunity to work in your life as He never has before. This is your opportunity to go from pain to gain as you experience the hand of God in a way that will reveal to you His love, His power, His comfort, His grace, and mercy. And because of it all, someday you'll be able to pour into someone else that same love and comfort. And someday through your life, God is going to receive great thanksgiving, glory, and praise. So in the midst of it all, in the midst of it all, I want to challenge you to trust God with your life. Let's continue to pray, to worship, to believe that no matter what happens in this life, He's a God who will always be with us, who's always to take, who's He's able to always take us through it all. Amen. Amen.